Wow, what an incredible story of God's faithfulness. God is using, using Bajang to reach the Iranian people, uh, not only inside the country, which he's reaching 1,700 people weekly. The majority of them are inside Iran. But he's reaching thousands of people who have fled Iran in, in different refugee camps. And, and we share this story with you this morning because here's what we want you to know. If you're a giver to abundant life, your faithful generosity and giving is impacting the world. Bill Gibbs, our outreach pastor, says this, we are locally rooted, but we are globally connected. You might live here in Lee Summit or, or Greenwood, Raymore, Grandview, Blue Springs, and your family might be rooted here in Lee Summit, but because of your faithful giving, you are globally connected. And God is using that faithfulness to reach people all across this world. And that is something, church, to celebrate even now in this place. Because you get to reach people not only in your city, not only across the country, but across the globe. And that's awesome. So as we continue our service, we're going to begin to worship that creator, that, that, that giver of life. So if you want mine, rise into your feet, singing a shout of praise to your king, to your creator this morning. Whoa.
I love that song. Just getting to declare, man, our shame, it's gone. The stone, so the stone is gone, it is rolled away, it is done because of what Jesus did on the cross. Amen. That's why we're here, that's why we celebrate, that's why we are pumped because of what Jesus is doing here in this place. And the beauty of it is that he made a way where there was no way, where there was no hope. And sometimes I forget and I need to step back and be reminded, without Jesus, there's nothing. He's our hope for the future. He's our hope for eternity. And this is your first time in this place. We want you to know that truth. We're celebrating because of what Jesus has done. And we introduced this song a few weeks ago. And honestly, it's a song that has met our church in a time of a lot of heartache and pain and trying to honestly figure out like, God, what are you doing? And for me, I just get reminded in the midst of the, the tough times, that verse where it says, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. I don't know if you've ever been there before. It's like, I know that God is good, but there's a little part of me that's struggling. Like, is he really? And so this song, we love it because sometimes we just need to declare truths of who our God is, that he is a way maker. He's a promise keeper, not just a promise maker. He makes promises, but tell you what, he follows through on those promises. You may not fully understand it now, but we're gonna sing this song sometimes to just to build our faith. We need to declare these truths together. And that's what we're gonna do today.
He's worthy of all of our praise, isn't he? He's worthy. We give Jesus a shout of praise right now, would you? He's so worthy. The resurrected Son of God, he lives. And that is why hope always lives. In church, everything God does in our life is meant to bring us near to him, closer to him, to a deeper surrender than we've ever been. And that's a move of God. I wanna pray right now for a move of the Holy Spirit, a move of God in our church, in our lives, in our city, across our land. I'm gonna do what I've done over and over again and get on my knees, get my face before him right here at this altar. I wanna invite you right now to come in one heart, one mind, as the bride of Christ at Abundant Life. Let's just get on our knees and just pray right now for a move of the Holy Spirit in our life, in our families, in our church, in our city, across our land.
moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship.
Father, thank you that you're the one in control. Thank you that you're the one that sacrificed a son on the cross for us. Thank you for the goodness of your word and the sweetness that comes only from you. Thank you for your presence in this place this morning as we worship. God, may you hear our voices and know that they come from a heart of surrender, a heart of passion for the King. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you for this morning. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. Would you just give him praise this morning just for his goodness? So glad you're here this morning. So thankful that you're here worshiping with us. Would you welcome somebody to this place? Shake their hand. Welcome them to the church. Well, good morning, church. It's great to see you out there. Y'all doing well? It's good to hear. Hey, my name is Steve, and I get to serve as one of the pastors here at Abundant Life, and just want to welcome you here to church. And if you're joining us online, thank you for tuning in wherever you are, but we'd love to invite you to join us here on campus uh, one Sunday. Uh, in the near future, we'd love to see you here. And um, hey, maybe this is your first time here. We want to thank you for coming out um, and joining us this morning. Hopefully you feel welcomed as a guest here. And as we continue in our service, we're going to take up our morning offering. So what do you, whatever you need to do to get ready for that, I want to encourage you to do that at this time. You can give three different ways at Abundant Life. You can text to give. You can give online. Or you can give uh, using the envelope in the seat back right there in front of you. So as we continue, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we love you. And God, we thank you that you love us more than we love us. And we're so thankful that you sent your son to die on the cross to demonstrate that love. And if we accept him as our Lord and Savior, God, you promise to save us and give, give us eternal life. And, we, and we, give, we give you all the praise and glory for that. And as we take up these tithes and these offerings, God, I pray that they'll continue to be used to further your kingdom and for your glory. Thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, we want to connect with you. There's two easy ways for us to do that with you. Uh, the first way is through the Next Steps card in the seat back in front of you. Um, if, if, if this is your first time here, we want to connect with you. If you wouldn't mind putting your name and your information down on that, dropping it in the offering bucket as it passes, or take it out to our Next Steps desk. We have a gift that we want to give you just to tell you thank you for being here. Uh, but maybe you've been coming to Abundant Life for many years, and, and you're thinking, man, I got to take my next step, whether that's um, beginning to give or joining a group, or maybe you need to start serving somewhere. I want to encourage you to fill that out as well. We want to help you in any way that we can to help you take your next step. And the second way that we want to connect with you is through our story room. Um, you can find that out here in our lobby. Um, what we really want to just tell you is we want to uh, tell you hi, hear your story, and just thank you for coming to Abundant Life this morning. Pastor Phil and some of our other staff members are going to be out there. would love to talk to you after today's service. Um, and as we're wrapping up our Global Outreach Month, I want to point you to 2020. Uh, we're going to be taking six global serve teams across the world. We're going to be going to places like Haiti, Central Asia, China, Juarez, Peru, El Salvador. And maybe you're thinking this, this year, your next step is to go on a global serve team. I want to encourage you to begin praying right now which one God is leading you to go on. Um, as you came in this morning, you got one of these cards that will give you more information. Um, and if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us. We'd love to answer any of, those, any of those questions that you might have. But thank you so much for being here this morning. I hope you guys have a great rest of your Sunday. involved with Abundant Life. We've been members since 2006. And about five years ago, we really got a sense, a calling to the mission field of living life on mission. And so we started working with other communities. And over the process, we formed a nonprofit organization called Agape Pomoja, which is simply showing love and community to others. So these are our Christian brothers and sisters that are Congolese, which is Central Africa, uh, working with this church and with Abundant Life. 
Every week we had volunteers out to the house. Um, every Saturday we would work from 9 o'clock until 1, 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, our goal was to have this house ready by Love KC. It was neat to see so many people from Abundant Life pitch in and go to the inner city of Kansas City, uh, a neighborhood that they have never probably been to, a neighborhood that I never spent much time in. This community has amazing stories of heartbreak, survival, and finding joy in trials and persecution that most Americans can't even imagine. This blessing house provides the first sense of stability where this family can have a future on solid ground. It ended up being a mother, a uh, single mother with seven kids. Even though we didn't know the family before uh, the move-in day, when the house was ready, it met all the needs for the family. So this family's been in the home for six months. We have driving permits, bank accounts, improvements in grades. They're with us at many ministry opportunities. We will see this family on Saturday uh, for choir as well as a service event. We'll see them on Tuesday for youth night. Uh, we see them on Sundays at church. They visit Abundant Life. They'll join us at Yesenia Jibu. You could see the, the joy on the kids' faces as they ran through the house. It's just great to see a family of, with seven kids uh, in a safe environment. Thank you, Abundant Life, for your support, your generous giving, and your willingness to serve alongside this community. And thank you, Abundant Life. Is that exciting? I'm so thankful for your generosity as we are living together fearlessly to reach our city for time and eternity. So we've had several initiatives we talked about in our fearless campaign. You've heard a lot about the Compassion Center, the church in Peru. We're sponsoring a thousand children there. And together, we're going to make a difference in that part of the world right here from our own city. Of course, we're launching the campus in Blue Springs this year, Christmas Eve. And then the other thing we wanted to do was this blessing house. You know, the whole job of the whole church is to preach the whole gospel to the whole world. But we live at a time the world is coming to us. So we saw an opportunity with partnership with Agape Promoja to buy this house, we call it a blessing house, and this refugee family from the Congo is now there, and it's an opportunity to minister the gospel to the nations because the nations are now coming here. And so I'm so thankful to get to be a part of a church that is so missional and kingdom-minded, and that's what we've been talking about all month long in our global outreach month. Second Corinthians chapter 9 is where we're going to be today. I'm going to give you up front, just heads up, I'm not going to get through all the notes today. Some of you are like, yes, God is a miracle worker. <laughs> I told the first service, you want to hear the rest of the sermon, you're going to have to come to the second service. It's going to be like in phases today, third service gets the third place. It's just, we, we linger. Some, we just need to linger sometimes in God's presence, don't we? And uh, we need to do more of that. And that means uh, there's times I'm just not going to get through all my notes, and I hope that's okay with you because you know, I've always got more to say, and we'll say it some other time. So last night, I thought, you know, God is a miracle worker. Here we go. I'm watching TV. It's late. I usually try to get to bed early on a Saturday night. Uh, normally, I can go to bed early on a Saturday night because the Kansas game is over by halftime. <laughs> so last night, I have to watch the entire game because they're still in the game in the fourth quarter. And Texas Tech pulled a Kansas. They found the one way there was to lose that game. KU wins. <laughs> Miracle worker, that made some of our day. Okay, shout out to K-State, you beat Oklahoma, okay? There, are you happy? Shout out to Missouri. This is a place of grace. Okay, it's all inclusive. Everybody gets to cheer for something. What did Missouri do yesterday? <laughs> to Kentucky? Yes. A basketball school? Okay, just. <laughs> so last night I'm watching the Kansas game with a grilled cheese sandwich. Best grilled cheese I ever had. For obvious reasons. 
How many of you like to have a grilled cheese once in a while? Enjoy a grilled cheese sandwich? Yeah, I do too. Okay. Look on the package next time of your cheese before you have the grilled cheese, because there's a really good chance on that package is this man's name right here, Borden. This is William Borden. In 1904, he was heir to the Borden family fortune, but he got a vision for the Great Commission. In 1904, as heir to the Borden family fortune, he graduated from high school. His father sent him on a trip around the world as a graduation gift. In those days, of course, you couldn't fly anywhere. He set sail, and he literally sailed around the world, and it was there that he began to get a vision for the nations. This young man was a sold-out, surrendered Christian. He began to see the fields that were widened to harvest, remembering what Jesus said, to lift up your eyes. The fields are widened to harvest as he went through Europe and the Middle East and then Asia. By the time he got to Asia, he was convinced God was calling him to China. He wrote his father and said, Dad, I no longer want to run the family business. I don't care about the family fortune. I've seen another harvest. It's the harvest of men and women. And you can imagine his father was not remotely happy by his decision. But he wasn't going to retreat because he'd seen what could be, he'd seen what must be. And you see, that is what it means to live for eternity. That is what it means to really live with focus as a Christian, to be more than a Sunday Christian, to understand that it's more than something we do, it's something we are. And Jesus has sent us on mission, Acts 1 and verse 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you to be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, to take the gospel from our neighbors to the nations. And that's what the early church was about. That's what Paul is doing. And 2 Corinthians chapter 9, as he begins teaching once again on New Testament generosity, we give so others can go, because we can't all go where they can go, but we can all give so they can go. In the early days of Christianity, they were taking up a collection financially to bless those churches and those people that were in poverty. And what we learn today is about the law of the harvest, and I want to talk today about the law of the harvest, all right? There's some certain laws God wants you to understand that you will always reap what you sow. Galatians 6, be not deceived, God is not mock, whatever man sows, that shall he also reap. Now normally, we think that law or that principle has negative connotations, and sometimes it does. Like, if you sow the seeds of sin, you will eventually reap ruin. It's a universal truth. It's true for everybody. If you sow the seeds of disobedience, it may take 20 years, but you will get back what you sowed in destruction. On the other hand, if you sow the seeds of obedience, you will eventually reap blessing. That's the law of the harvest. You reap what you sow. Now listen, whether you give generously or sparingly, you always reap more than what you've sown. That's the law of the harvest. So we see it this time of year, living in the Midwest, all right, the bread basket of the world. Uh, all the farmers are out right now combining their beans. Now, I don't know if you're maybe a farm boy or a farm girl. I'm kind of a, you know, kind of a hobby farmer. I'm a wannabe, okay? I've got a 30-acre bean field on this little farm that Chris and I bought a few years ago outside of town here. And so I have a, a farmer. He farms his, like, great, great big bean field. And then right next to his big bean field is my little bean field. And so I've learned a little bit about this. But do you know that a farmer puts a single soybean in the ground in the spring, and from that one soybean, he anticipates getting 150 to 300 beans in the fall. That's a 300% return on investment. You see, that's the ROI. One bean gives you 150 to 300 beans. You see, that's the law of the harvest. And so whether you sow a lot or a little, not just financially, but in every part of your life personally, you will reap what you sow, and you will reap more than what you sowed. It's true in your marriage. So we're going back to Ephesians next week, getting back in our verse-by-verse -verse study of Ephesians. Guess where we left off? Not accidentally, but strategically. We left off... So we can go back to, into a marriage series. Ephesians chapter five, the greatest dissertation ever written on marriage. Ephesians chapter five. This is in our marriage series that starts next week. But let me ask you, what have you sown into your marriage? See, I hear people talk all the time, Pastor Phil, you know, we've been married 20 years and we've just fallen out of love. So fall back in love. Get over it. 
You can fall back in love. You know how? You start sowing the seeds that made you fall in love. You stop sowing those seeds, so now you fell out of love. Start sowing the seeds that first made you fall in love. That's how you fall back in love. Here's a hint. Don't wait on your spouse to serve you. Like Logic says, I will love my spouse more if they serve me more. That's not how it works. You don't merely serve the one you love. You love the one you serve. See, when you start sowing seeds into that relationship, you naturally will fall in love with the one you are serving. You don't merely serve the one you love. That's how you stay in love. It's true of anything in life. If you want to love your spouse more, serve your spouse. You want to love God more, serve God. You want to love your church more, serve your church. See, when you sow the seeds, you get that return. That's how it works. And not just what you sowed, but you get more than what you sowed. There's this thing called compounding interest. It can work for you or against you. Like, I hope you pay off your credit card debt at the end of every month. You know why? Because if you don't, there's this thing called compounding interest. And you're going to be in debt to the credit card company for the rest of your life. It's compounding interest. It's working against you. On the other hand, it can work for you. If you're 20 years old today and you start saving 20 bucks a week for the rest of your life and you put it into an interest-bearing account, you will be amazed at how much you have 20 years from now. Because you don't just get back what you put in. You get back more than what you put in. That is the law of the harvest. And that's what the Apostle Paul is teaching now to the Corinthians. Remember the backstory. He's writing the Corinthian church because they're taking up this offering as a relief effort. Disaster relief. And so the early Christians and those that were the apostles and those missionaries were going from church to church in the early days of Christianity. And they were taking up kind of a corporate collection of all the churches for a uh, relief effort because there was such famine uh, in all the land at this time. Now, the Corinthians were very wealthy, remember. They lived in a city of prosperity, and because of that, a year earlier, they'd made these big promises about how much they were going to give. So far, they've given nothing. And so he's compared them to Macedonians who had nothing but had given everything so generously. He's saying, guys, look at the example of the Macedonians. Though they are in poverty, they have given so liberally with generosity. He's saying, listen, you made a promise a year ago. I'm going to send Titus, my ministry partner, and I want you to be prepared to take up the collection when he gets there and just perform that which you promised. So we pick it up here in verse 5. You ready for this? Say, fearless. Yes. Here we go. He says, therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised a year ago, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. So Paul's writing them ahead of time saying, guys, get ready. I just want to prepare your heart ahead of time. You said you'd give to this offering to help those that are in poverty. I'm going to be sending someone to you, and I want you to prepare it so that you don't come with this grudging obligation like, okay, okay Paul, here you go, fine. No, he wants it to be something that they delight in doing, not something that they have to do because they want to. So he's trying to prepare them ahead of time, right? So it's not this grudging obligation, but rather it's born out of genuine generosity. And right there is the value system for New Testament giving. It goes beyond tithing. For all the church today talks about tithing, tithing is simply a baseline. Tithing is not the finish line. Tithing is simply a guide. Generosity may mean the tithe, which is a tenth of your income, or it may mean less than the tithe, or it may mean more than the tithe. Generosity is between you and Jesus to figure out what that looks like for you. And what is really generous for some is not generous at all for others. Tithing is easy for some, not costly for others. It's a huge stretch of faith. It's very risky. And so God wants you in your own grace in your own prayer time as you seek him, start figuring this out. What does this look like in your life personally? Because generosity is the heart of God. Generosity is one of the marks of spiritual maturity. And I've said before, listen, you don't have to be rich to be generous. You just have to be generous to be generous. See, generosity is not a commodity of the wealthy. Generosity can sometimes be seen in those who are in poverty. Because generosity is born out of something other than money. 
So I told you a couple of weeks ago, your pastor doesn't know who gives what, how much you give. I don't want to know how much you give financially. And I'll tell you why, because I'm just a dude. I'm just a guy. And what that means is I could be influenced by money. I don't want to be influenced by money. I don't want to be controlled by money. I don't want my opinion of you to change because of how much you give or don't give. So I just don't know. Now, I said that last week or two weeks ago, uh, and then, uh, then I found out how much somebody in our church gives. So in just full disclosure, just being honest, there's one member of our church that I do know now how much they give. Dave Williams, our business administrator, he's the only one that sees who gives what. He doesn't tell me who gives what, but he happened to come to me a while back and said, Pastor Val, I want you to know this story. This is such an amazing story. So for months and months and months and months, there's this family, and they would very faithfully give their offering in an offering envelope. And clearly it was a family, you know, write their tithe check out. And with the tithe check and the offering envelope, every single week, there's this $1 bill. And so I finally asked them, what is the story with the $1 bill? Well, turns out it's the Heck family, which is a heck of a name, don't you think? I bet they've never heard that before, have they? So this is Howard and Linda Heck, and their son is Chad. Chad is 46. Chad has special needs. Chad is on our Precious Stones ministry. And what Linda told me is that every single week, he holds the family accountable for their offering. He collects the offering, he puts it in the offering envelope, and then from his little job that he has, he always gives a dollar. And he has over and over again, year after year, year after year. I think they are here this morning would you give it up for Chad? I am so thankful, Chad, for your faithfulness and your fidelity. There they are. Chad, would you stand? Because I was looking over here, and there you are. Chad, we're so proud of you, man. Thank you for being an inspiration to us, for being an example to us, an example of generosity. And Chad, you're going to hear these words one day. Joby talked about them a week ago from the parable of the talents. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. God's going to make you ruler over much. Amen. Glory be to God. Amen. See, that is the principle of generosity. It doesn't matter how much you have to give. It's what you do with what you have to give. Some of us have a lot, others have less, but we will never be accountable before God for what we don't have. We will only be accountable before God what we do have and what we did with what we had. And the law of the harvest says, if you're faithful over the little, one day God's gonna make you ruler over much. And I want you to see that ultimately, whether you give generously or sparingly, you will always reap more than what you've given, but you will always reap in proportion to what you've given. Uh, sow a little, reap a little. Sow much, reap much. This is the next thing Paul says now. He says, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he that sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And so the reality is God wants you to reap a bounty, but you can't reap a bounty until you've lived obediently. Now, this is where a lot of the prosperity teachers, once again, they take this text and they try to prove to you that God is some type of cosmic slot machine. And if you put enough quarters in, God will like, ching, 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 and you win the lotto or something. That's not what Paul's teaching here. There is a, there's a temporal principle, and it's this. If we're not being faithful with what God has given us today, we have no expectation that God would give us more tomorrow. If I can't be faithful with the little bit God has given me, then there's no reason that I should ask God to give me more. Why would God give me more when I'm not being faithful with what I have, all right? So there's a temporal principle there. But I want you to understand, the promises of God are always from the scope of eternity, not time. Right? It's not a promise that if you sow your seed financially that you're going to have a six-figure income in a four-car garage. It's not what God has promised. But he has promised to meet your necessities. He has promised to meet your needs. That's absolutely a promise. 
And what Paul is teaching here about sowing in, 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 in a bounty to reap a bounty is in eternity. Ultimately, as you're faithful in this life with what you have, there's going to be another life that lasts forever, and you can live a life now that is faithful. And if you live a life now that is faithful, he promises you will be fruitful. How many of you want to be fruitful? I want to be fruitful. I do. All right, Jesus said in John 15, I have ordained that you should bear fruit and your fruit should remain, the fruit of changed lives. Now here's the reality, some of us are fruitless. And if you wanna be fruitful, being fruitful comes from being faithful. And some of us aren't being fruitful because we haven't been faithful with the little God has given us today. So I want you to see the reality is God wants you not to be barren, he wants you to have babies. I mean spiritually speaking. All right, think about this. What is the mark of maturity physically? The mark of maturity physically is not when you get your first iPhone, sorry. <laughs> the mark of maturity physically is not when you get your driver's license. Definitely not. The mark of maturity physically is what? When you can reproduce. Now listen, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Some of us really shouldn't. Right? I mean, honestly. But on the other hand, if the mark of maturity physically is the ability to reproduce, what's the mark of maturity spiritually? Is not how deep you can go theologically. Is not how much you know doctrinally. That just proves you know how to do Bible study. And there's lots of people that know a lot theologically that have never reached spiritual maturity. The mark of maturity spiritually is when you are reproducing. A changed life changes lives. You see, ultimately, what God is looking is to use your life and change your life so that through your life, other lives will change too. Listen, God did not save you just to save you. He saved you so that through you, he can save others too. That's what it means to live a fruitful life. And this is what we've been doing as a church for 19 years now. The goal has always been to bear fruit for the kingdom, the fruit of changed lives. The mission of our church is to see lives changed by Jesus. It all began 19 years ago with this little bitty apple tree, all right? This little bitty tree that had no fruit. That's who we were 19 years ago. But we dreamed of having fruit. And so what did we do? We were just faithful sowing the seed, the seed of the gospel over and over again, the seed of the word of God over and over again. And you know what God began to do? He began to grow us from infancy into a place of maturity where all of a sudden we started putting on fruit. And God has used our church in the lives of thousands in the last 19 years years in our city and around the world, that lives of thousands have been changed. God has given us much fruit. But listen, the goal of being fruitful is never addition. It's always multiplication. It's true in your life. It's true in my life. It's true in the life of our church. You see, the goal is never just to become a bigger tree with more fruit. No, you, you fulfill the great commission, living on mission, not through addition, but multiplication. So what happened? In the last three years, we've started three churches. We're about to launch a church in Peru, and we're about to launch a campus in Blue Springs, too. You see, the way you get the law of the harvest is multiplication is not addition. And so the goal of your life is the same vision as it is for our church. The goal one day will be that our churches we've started are starting churches too. And the campuses we start, start campuses too. There's going to be about 400 people here today that won't be here in just a few months from now because you're going to be going over to Blue Springs. And tonight at 6.30, if you want to walk through the new facility and see the construction, see how it's going, going to do a walkthrough tonight at 6.30, if that's an interest to you. Now check this out. You're going to Blue Springs, starting this campus, and the goal will not be that you simply grow larger and bear fruit that's there. The win will be when that Blue Springs campus is starting a campus of its own down the highway somewhere. You see, that's the law of the harvest. It starts with reproduction, but the goal is that what you've reproduced itself starts reproducing. All of a sudden, it's not reproduction, it's multiplication, and that's when the family tree really begins to blossom. It's when you start having babies. I have two grown children that are married. It's really hard to fathom, still is. So I've got three kids. Josh is my bachelor, he's still at home. My uh, two oldest kids have been married now a couple years, and they still haven't made any grandbabies. 
and I'm not happy. Everybody says, oh, Pastor Phil, you watch. Grandkids are the best. I wouldn't know. Do I sound bitter? So, you know, look, I get it, guys. You, you know, your, your first year, that's, a, that's an alibi. That, that's a, you know, you get a pass. Year two, what are you waiting on? Let's get busy. Do you need me to have the talk again with you? Like we had the talk in middle school. You ought to know what to do, right? So, so everybody, oh, grandkids are the best. Listen, the goal of having children is to live to see your children's children and their children. I mean, guys, listen, give me some grandbabies. Give your father some grandchildren. <laughs> you know what God your father is saying to some of you? Hey, give me some grandkids. I didn't save you just to save you. I saved you to save others through you. See, the mark of maturity is reproduction. It's reproducing Jesus in you and through you. God, your father's looking, some of you are going, daughter, listen, I love you, but it's time to give me some grandbabies. So let me ask you a question. Where is the fruit in your life? When is the last time you shared Jesus with anyone that was far from God? When is the last time you went on a global serve team trip? When is the last time you walked across the cubicle or across the neighborhood to tell somebody you need to about Jesus. You see, ultimately, God wants to use you to bear fruit through you, fruit that remains, fruit that will last, fruit that will last forever. That's called living a life that really matters. And I want you to see, that's the law of the harvest. You're that seed. God invested that seed in you, and now God wants that return on investment too. Where's the seed? How has it multiplied in you and through you? Listen carefully. Our goal as a church one day is not to just be this great big apple tree with all this fruit. It's to ultimately live to see a whole orchard of trees. I'm talking about campuses that are reproducing campuses and churches we started reproducing churches. We have the opportunity to take the gospel to every crevice and corner of our city. And you better believe we're not retreating. It's an advanced mentality. And not just here, but everywhere. It's the job of the whole church to take the whole gospel to the whole world. And you see, this ultimately is what it means to live with no reserve. So it was William Borden when his dad said, William, you're making a big mistake. I'm going to cut you out of the family fortune. I'm cutting you out of the family will. If you don't come back home and run the family business, it said that he wrote in the back of his Bible, no reserves. And we have to come to the place in our life where we have no reserves. Like we're not holding out on God. We're withholding nothing from God. We've come to a complete surrender before God, complete submission to the Son of God, no reservation. And I just want you to understand, that's how we're living. That's what it means to live fearlessly without any reserves whatsoever. Listen carefully. Money is meant to be enjoyed. I got to move quick. All right, I want you to understand, as we talk about generosity, especially generosity financially, sometimes um, we can foster what amounts to just guilt, guilty. Like, you know, I don't know if I should have this vanilla latte. I mean, I spent five bucks on a cappuccino and just think about what that could have done on the mission field. Oh, stop it. <laughs> Sometimes we're so heavenly minded, we're of no earthly good. It's okay. Enjoy a latte. All right, it's okay. But, but, but my point is your priorities. All right, so you need to budget your finances where you're able to enjoy a little bit this side of heaven. God gives you that for a reason. Don't be guilty if you have a lot of money. Uh, one of the most misquoted Bible verses in all of scriptures, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10. Well, you know what the Bible says. Money is the root of all evil. No, that's not what it says. What does it say? Oh, man, you guys have been taught well. <laughs> Advanced class, I can tell. Yeah, it's not, money is not evil. It's not the root of all evil. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil because the love of money becomes idolatry, and idolatry leads to captivity. And so you need some money. God gives you some money. Enjoy it. It's okay. So I came home this week, and this is what I saw. My farmer was combining my beans. I love to see my farmer combining my beans. I go in the house, I look at Krista, and I say, listen, hush, shh, shh, shh. Do you hear that? Can you hear the combine out back? I said, you know what that sound is? No. 
I said, baby, that is the sound of money. I love that sound. Now, it's not a lot of money. Don't misunderstand. I think I got about $3,500 last year on my beans. But guess what it is? It's what I call fun money. It's my vacation money. And I save that money every year to take my family on vacation. And so you need some money like that, fun money. Enjoy, go on vacation, make a memory. But, but, but under, it's meant to be more than enjoyed. It's also meant to be employed. God gives you money, take care of your needs materially. He knows you need your money to pay your bills, your gas, your groceries, your necessities. And so if you haven't done it yet, you need to start thinking strategically about your money. Because most of us work for our money instead of our money working for us. So if you haven't been to Financial Peace University, you don't have a budget, there's a really good chance you're in chaos. You'd love to be generous, but you can't be generous because you have no intention financially, strategically. And so I'm trying to get you today as a steward of what God has given you. And that's what we are. We're managers, not owners. God has made you a manager of his resources to manage it well. You need a budget. Try to come to the place in life where you can save 10%. You can... Give 10%, and then you can live on the 75%. You guys aren't even listening. You probably think I meant to do that. I did. Okay, so 10, 10, 80 is what I call it, okay? Live on 80%, roughly speaking, or you can maneuver it however you want. J.C. Penney has said that he lived on 10%, gave away 90 all right, so maneuver it however you want, but the point is you've got a strategy. Money's meant to be enjoyed, it's meant to be employed, and it's meant to be deployed. So you need to think about the money that you're going to deploy. What do I mean? You're using it now for kingdom priorities. You're using it now to advance his name, his fame, from the neighbors to the nations. That's what it means to deploy your money. You're deploying it to ministry in a way that now is going to affect people's lives for eternity. So I have this nightstand right next to where I sleep. And this week I pulled out of my nightstand where I sleep this Guatemalan money. It's been in there for years. You say, Phil, why do you have Guatemalan money in your nightstand? Everybody has a drawer like that. Come on. <laughs> you know, it's the drawer you just stuff stuff. So it's like walking down memory lane when you open that drawer. I open my nightstand drawer. I find this Guatemalan money this week. It's been there for years. You know why? Because the last time I was in Guatemala, years and years ago, I forgot to change it back to U.S. currency. Guess what? It's worth nothing here. Now listen carefully. I don't know if you realize this or not, but your U.S. currency is worth nothing in the country we are going. If you knew that you were going to a different country tomorrow and you would never come back, guess what you would do? You'd get rid of all your currency today, you would change it for the currency that really matters where you're going. And do you understand that all of our money that we have today is of no value to the country we are going? We are kingdom citizens, we are kingdom people in a different country that's gonna last for all of eternity. Now here's the deal, you can't spend it where you're going, but you know what Jesus said? You can change it out today. He said, lay not up treasure on earth where moth and rust destroys, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up treasure in heaven where neither moth and rust corrupts, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. He was teaching, listen, the country you're going to, the one you're gonna spend eternity in, you cannot spend what you have today, but you can send it on ahead. You can change it into that which is eternal and the things that last forever. You see, your dollars mean destinies. When we're trying to practice generosity as a church, I don't know if you realize this or not, but if we are successful in sponsoring a thousand kids together at 38 bucks a month, by the way, we're at 800. That's awesome. A thousand kids at 38 bucks a month. Basically, guess what our church is saying? Half a million dollars a year. Don't send it here. Send it there. 
See, we're trying to embody this core value of generosity. What pastor stands up and says, don't, don't, don't give it here, give it there. I'm telling you, that's what I'm telling you to do. But I wanna remind you of something. If you're not supporting your church, we can sponsor a thousand kids, but guess what? There's no church in Peru, there's no Compassion Center too. See, if you're not sponsoring your church, in addition, there's no Blue Springs campus, there's no food pantry that ministers to thousands of people all over our city. There's no blessing house ministering to this Congolese family. So I'm asking as you pray about what generosity looks like in your life, don't forget the place you serve, the place you go to church, because this is the place from which everything else goes out. And I don't know about you, but I made the decision. I'm not keeping anything here. I'm gonna send it on ahead. People are not remembered for what they had, they're remembered for what they gave. And at the judgment seat of Christ, Jesus is not gonna say, well, what kind of house did you live in? Why didn't you drive a nicer car? You know, at the judgment seat of Christ, the question is simply going to be, what is the fruit that you have brought me? The law of the harvest says, he invests his seed in you, that Genesis 3.15 seed, the seed of Christ who lives in you. And now, he wants to multiply it in you and through you, all around you. So you're not gonna hear the rest of the sermon. but I want you to live it today. I want you to take it with you. I want you to take that seed that God has given you. I want you to invest it in eternal ways so that you can live as William Borden with no retreat, no reserves, no regret. Stand before Jesus with no regret. Would you bow with me, Jesus? I pray for every person in this place. And Lord, we surrender today all that we have and all that we are for all that you have and all that you are. Somebody would say, Pastor Phil, I've listened to the Spirit of God and the Word of God these last four weeks. God is doing a work in me. And I'm praying that God would show me my next step spiritually, especially in this area of generosity. And I will not waste this seed that has been given to me. I'm just gonna ask you right now to raise your hand. Would you, I wanna pray with you. Just raise your hand up high. I'm gonna ask you to stand up right now. Just stand up. We're gonna pray together. We're gonna commit this to Jesus before we leave. I want you to raise both hands to heaven, the universal sign of surrender. And let's do this together. Let's pray. Jesus, I surrender all that I have for all that you are. Help me to live the law of the harvest, to be faithful so that I can be fruitful, to live a life that really matters to do exploits that will last forever. Fill me, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Claim the promise of Acts 1-8 right now. Jesus, you promised the power of the Holy Spirit to be witnesses for you in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Multiply our life and the lives of others. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Would you give Jesus the glory with me? Praise him, would you? <laughs> Guys, love you a whole bunch. All these folks are right here at this platform to minister to you, to pray with you, whatever it might be in your life. Maybe you wanna know what it means to be a Christian, seriously. 
to make certain of your destiny eternally. That's why these folks are here to minister in between our services. God bless you. Hope you have a super blessed Sunday.